Um, okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, we're going to continue a series that I started at the beginning of the year. And this is a series on upaya, skillful means or expedient means. And what we've been doing is we've been going through the, param the paramitas, the practices of a bodhisattva, which are, of course, giving, moral discipline, and patience. And today's topic, virya, determination, meditation, and wisdom. So those are the six paramitas that we're going to be looking at or have already looked at some. We're going to continue. But we're not just looking at these six practices. We are looking at them in terms of upaya, in terms of skillfulness. So tonight, we are specifically talking about skillful virya. And if we translate virya as determination, I like to translate it as drive, like being driven. You could also translate it as vigor. There's even a chance that the English word vigor, big, vigor, energetic, there's a chance that the word vigor comes from the Sanskrit virya. There are English words that are related to virya that do mean kind of um, energy in a way. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And this is one of those teachings tonight, virya. It's one of those teachings that you do find plenty of in the early Buddhist teachings. And so I'm actually going to start tonight by talking about virya as it would be and as it is understood in the early Buddhist tradition. And then we're going to shift gears and we're going to talk about skillful virya. And then we're going to return to our sutra, which is the Upaya Sutra. And the last part of tonight, we're going to look at some controversial dharma. That's right. We're going to look at some controversial sections of this sutra that, that I'm going to do my best job to connect to this idea of virya. So I'm going to do a little weaving uh, this evening in that way. So um, let's go ahead and get started with just talking about virya, this idea of determination or drive or energy or perseverance. Or you could also think of virya, so not translate it, but you could think of virya as the opposite of laziness. The opposite of sloth and torpor, right? Uh, thina minha, I believe it is in the Pali. Uh, thina midha, so sloth and torpor, low energy, again, laziness. Well, that's not virya. <laughs> virya is get up and go, drive, again, determination. So let's start with sort of a... Um, yeah, let me start with kind of a general description of this as a essential part of the practice, by which I mean the practice of Buddhism, whether it's Theravada, kind of a Hinayana st style Buddhism or a Mahayana style Buddhism, doesn't matter. This idea of virya is going to be key. I also, though, want, because of where I'm about to go right now, I also want you to know that there's another word, another term, another idea called viyama, effort. And the idea of right effort is one of the Noble Eightfold Path. And I basically want you to know that these terms, definitely for tonight, these terms are interchangeable. So if you're used to the language of right effort, putting forth effort, or in particular, the four right efforts, which I'm going to talk about. The idea is, is that effort, viyama, and virya, they're synonymous in that way. So let's start with why 
determination or virya, let's start with why that's essential to the practice. So an example that I often like to give to sort of just start talking and thinking about this idea of virya, it's like this. So let's say, and now again, I'm gonna use an example. So we're just gonna be over here in example land. An example is, let's say that I told you that there was a technique for inducing a lucid dream. There are, there are such techniques. In fact, I'm going to tell you a technique. Let's say I told you that one recommended technique for inducing a lucid dream is to develop a kind of habit of periodically stopping and asking yourself, why isn't this a dream? Like, why, what makes this kind of reality in that way? And, you know, there's a certain sense of embodiment. There's a certain sense of just a, a feeling tone about the world and about reality that if you ask yourself, am I dreaming? You can usually pretty quickly determine, oh yeah, no, like this is life. This is, this is life. And the idea is, is that if you make a habit of periodically, I don't know, you know, once an hour, a couple times a day, but if you get into the habit of doing that, you will inevitably be in a dream and you will do your periodic reality check where you stop and you ask yourself, all right, why isn't this, why is this in a dream? And you will instantly not feel <laughs> that same feeling tone of embodiment or that same feeling tone about reality, and you'll realize this is a dream. And then that induces a lucid state. And of course, if you haven't ever had a lucid dream, they can be fleeting at first, where you kind of realize you're in a dream, but then you quickly wake up. But if you keep doing the practice, you can get better at it and eventually sustain that lucid dreaming experience for longer periods of time. So there you go. That's just a, a little technique for inducing a lucid dream. Now let's say, well, now let's, let's say, let's remember, I just told you that, right? But let's say you now were like, ooh, that sounds good. I, I want to have a lucid dream. I've never had a lucid dream. I, I would like to do that. The point is, is that if you don't actually do the periodic reality check that I'm mentioning, like if you don't actually put forth the effort to do this thing, then you shouldn't be surprised if you don't have a lucid dream because you haven't put forth the effort in order to do so. All right, so that's an example. Let's come back to the Dharma because Buddhism is not about having lucid dreams, but it is about waking up, right? It is about buddhi, it is about awakening. So now let's say, let's say I'm up here every Sunday night and I'm telling you about how there's this thing called dukkha, suffering. And what if I told you that there was this person that they call the Buddha that figured out a way to bring suffering to an end? And there's some practices, there's some techniques about calming the mind and meditation and focused awareness and all of that, that could bring about such a state of not suffering. So the point is, is that I could tell you all the techniques, I could tell you the benefits, I could even get you fired up to, to not suffer. But if you don't actually do the meditation, if you don't actually do the practices, you've just heard about them, but you're not putting forth the effort to do them, you shouldn't be surprised if you're still suffering. You shouldn't be surprised in that way. So 
That's why virya, the effort, the determination is so essential to the practice. Because just knowing the techniques and just knowing what the promised result is, is not enough. You have to show up. You have to show up and you have to, in a way, put forth the effort. And so that's the idea of virya, effort. Okay, but now let's look at it a little differently. I want to also kind of remind you of a certain, a certain angle that I'm taking in approaching these six paramitas. Let's take, for example, last week. Last week, I talked about kashanti, patience. And the idea of patience, a kind of calm peacefulness, kashanti, is that it's not getting angry. So getting angry is not calm, is not patient, is not peaceful. It's getting angry. But what I've been mentioning in all of these classes is that Buddhism, this tradition, recognizes that it is kind of normal to get angry. It's kind of built into our conditioning. It's built into our biology to sort of defend ourselves <clears throat> to uh, to bare teeth, like you see, again, you see this behavior in all kinds of animals that they do get angry, they defend themselves, they bark, or they hiss, or they, you know, but they do things to exhibit this kind of behavior. And Buddhism recognizes that it's kind of a normal thing to get angry. And in that way, to be patient to perform or to practice kashanti, it's kind of extraordinary. It's kind of extraordinary. It's like superhuman to do this. And I think that this is an important approach, the Bo this Buddhist approach to things like anger and all of these different uh, uh, afflictions or defilements of the mind. I think it's nice or important to know that Buddhism doesn't see these things as like evil shortcomings in that way. In, in many ways, they see it as totally natural. But again, what they're talking about in terms of being natural is that it is a conditioned behavior. It's a conditioned response. And the Buddhist idea about conditioned responses is that they can feel like free will. It can feel like you are enacting your free will to yell or scream or express yourself. When the realization is, is actually that's just going along with one's conditioned behavior. And so again, it's extraordinary to be patient. It's extraordinary to be generous and, and, and giving, whereas it's kind of normal in a kind of conditioned way, it's kind of normal to just hoard, keep it to myself, look out for number one, right? In a way, again, that's just sort of normal and it's extraordinary to be generous, extraordinary to give. And there are extraordinary results from being extraordinary in that way. And I'm going to get to those extraordinary result, uh, yeah, results in a second, but I just kind of want to point that out. And so when it comes to virya, tonight's topic, it's kind of about recognizing that a, a kind of lethargy, a kind of laziness, a kind of that kind of low energy is actually kind of conditioned. It's kind of um, again, it's kind of built into us to sort of relax as much as possible and like be in that kind of a state. And so it's extraordinary to put forth the effort. It's extraordinary to put forth the effort in that way. So I kind of want to look at it 
tonight in that way. And yeah, and so let's just kind of keep those two options in mind. And let me now mention another thing about virya, this idea of determination or drive as it pertains to laziness. So I often like to talk about virya, determination, as it pertains to enlightenment, as it pertains to, <clears throat> uh, yeah, the, like the goal in that way, like ending suffering, awakening, or enlightenment. And it often happens that when people first start studying the Dharma and they hear of the Four Noble Truths, and in particular, they hear that the cause of suffering, the cause of dukkha that I mentioned a moment ago, the cause of that suffering is a kind of craving, a wanting, a, a desiring in that way. And so students of the Dharma, when they first learn the Four Noble Truths, Clever, clever students will often say, but isn't wanting to be enlightened? Isn't wanting to end my suffering? Isn't that a desire? Isn't that a craving as well to be enlightened or to end suffering? And the idea is it, it can be. <laughs> but here's the idea. And this is the example that I often give when referring to virya as it pertains to enlightenment. So let's say you decide that you're going to jog every morning. You, 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 did, you have decided that it would be in your best interest that you, want to, that you want to do that. And so if you've ever done something like that, a kind of practice or a kind of discipline where you're going to get up every morning and do something. Sure, at first it can be a little difficult, but eventually it kind of becomes second nature in a way. And the point is, is that now let's say you you get up every morning and you jog five miles a day and you come back and you feel great and all of that, right? And now let's say somebody sees you doing that every morning, getting up, jogging. They might ask you, why are you doing that? Are you going to run a marathon? And you might say, no, I'm not going to run a marathon. And they might say, well, are you going to, you're going to, you're trying to get into the Olympics. No, not trying to get into the Olympics. And then they might say, well, if you're not trying to like run a marathon or get in the Olympics or whatever, you know, you could just stay in bed. <laughs> You could just not do that. And the person would perhaps say, yeah, I guess I could. But I'm driven to go jogging every morning. I'm driven. In other words, I can't imagine not getting up and jogging. And I'm not exactly doing it for any goal or any reason. I just can't imagine not doing that. My feeling about pursuing awakening or pursuing the ending of suffering, it's very similar to that. And what I mean is, is that if you hear that a good meditation practice, let's say an hour a day, can calm your mind down and eventually lead to the end of suffering in that way. And you're like, you know what? That sounds good to me. I'll give it a shot. And at first, it's a little difficult to meditate every day and whatever, but eventually you get into the groove of it and there's a way in which you can't imagine not doing it. And it just becomes part of your drive and determination in that way. You are just driven to do it. A lot of people pursue, I don't need, I shouldn't even be using this word pursue, I'm sorry, but a lot of people get involved in the arts, for example, painting, writing poetry. And the same thing could happen where someone would say, oh, wow, are you trying to be a, get into a museum? Or are you trying to get published? Or are you trying to whatever? And it could be, no, I, I just can't imagine not writing poetry. I just can't imagine not painting. And I don't have any goal 
like I'm not dis- like pursuing anything. It's it's an end unto itself in that way. That is how I kind of approach this idea of virya as it pertains to being driven to enlightenment mm-hmm. or being driven to the end of uh, to the ending of suffering. There's just this way in which you just can't not do that. And it's now at that point, it's not desirous, striving. I got to get there. I got to get to enlighten. I got to get to enlightenment. The, the mentality is just not like that. If you are in a way driven in that sense. And so again, I kind of think of Virya as that determination and drive that propels us into action, but it's not desire or goal oriented in that way, right? Okay, so a couple of more things, unless anybody has any questions, comments, or ideas about Virya so far. Not haven't really said that much. So a quick thing to about Virya as it is understood and practiced in the Hinayana or say the Theravada. So the first thing I want to tell you about, or it's just kind of a continuation of the ideas I've been saying so far. There's this idea of what they call the four right efforts. And remember, viyama or effort is related to this idea of virya. And it's if you don't know this, it's important to know this. The, there's this teaching called the four right efforts. And so it's about effort, but in four ways. And what it is, is it has to do with what they call uh, unwholesome dharmas arising. Akushala dharma, right? And the idea of that is in this four right efforts, they talk about bad or unwholesome dharmas arising in the mind. Things like, again, anger, bitterness, resentment, uh, uh, deception, deceptiveness, like things like that arising in the mind, right? And so the first right effort is, and I forget the exact order of these four, but one of the right efforts is to put forth the effort to not give rise to those unwholesome dharmas. That's the first one, the effort to not give rise to them. The second effort is if they have arisen, to not feed them to observe them, but not feed them. And then over here in the wholesome dharmas or the good dharmas, the good things, being kind, being compassionate, being truthful, things like that, those are wholesome. And so the third right effort or one another of the right efforts is that if, if one of those wholesome dharmas arises, we want to tend to it. We want to recognize it. We want to foster it. We want to cultivate it. And then the fourth right effort is that if you don't have any of the good dharmas arising, you should put forth the effort to get the good dharmas to arise. (laughs) So let me give you an example of this as it kind of relates to some of the other talks I've been given in this series. So let's say, that you have decided to do the practice, which by which I mean Buddhism, and you've learned about the five precepts that I talked about in the second part of this series about moral discipline, and you heard about that fifth precept about uh, alcohol, and you've decided, you know what? I recognize that alcohol isn't serving me. It's not helping me. I really recognize that that's not helpful in any way. And it's a precept to not, to not inebriate, to not get drunk. And so you, you take the precept and now you're on your way doing the practice. So 
the four right efforts as it pertains to this is basically regarding that desire to drink, regarding that desire to get drunk and get inebriated. Well, the idea is, is that if that desire arises, we don't really want to go visit our friends at the bar. We don't really want to do things that are going to fuel or feed that in that way. So we want to be careful, we want to be skillful and mindful of noticing when this desire arises in that way, being cognizant that we have decided that it's not in our best interest to do that. And so we want to take the right effort to not allow that desire to get bigger or greater or more in that sense. And then if we notice that we're in a situation, like let's say, let's say that you, uh, I don't know, you, you took up some activity, right? Or, you know, maybe you picked up painting again or writing poetry or rock climbing, it doesn't matter. But let's say you have found an activity where when you're doing it, you're really absorbed in doing it. And the point is, is that you've noticed that when you do it, you don't have that desire to get inebriated. You don't have that desire to, to get drunk. Then that's a situation you want to foster. That's a situation that you'd like to then like pay attention to, paying attention to your mind in that state and recognizing that in that situation, that desire doesn't arise in that situation. And so that's cultivating the non-arising of that dharma in that way. And then of course, over on this side, there is this, the, the wholesome dharma, the good dharma of, and what would be the opposite of being drunk and inebriated? Clear-minded, clear in the head, not all blah, 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 what all sleepy and drunk, but clear, bright, awake, right? That's the opposite. That's going to be the wholesome dharma of noticing when you are clear and awake in that way. And of course, doing meditation is considered a very good way to get the mind clear in that sense. And so the idea is, is that if you notice that that clarity is arising, the good dharma of a clear mind is arising through meditation or through your practice of rock climbing or doing the arts or whatever. But if you notice that that clarity of mind is arising, you want to foster that. That's going to be the, our, our third aspect of right effort. And then, of course, the idea is, is that if we notice that there is no clarity in the mind, we would want to then seek out and find a way to cultivate, to bring forth the wholesome, the kushala dharma of a clear mind. And that would be the four right efforts as it pertains just to observing that one precept. And it would go for all of those things in that way. So that's another aspect of right effort or virya as it pertains to the early school. I will, I want to tell you one more area in which virya appears in the early teachings. Oh, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Please, sorry, no, I didn't realize. It's okay. Uh, um... I've always thought, or it, and I think I learned it somewhere, I didn't make it up, you know, how the Eightfold Path is divided into uh, Shila, Samadhi, and Pranya, and that right effort is in the Samadhi category. And, and so I've always thought of it as being specific to the effort of mindfulness and concentration, which isn't exactly contradict what you're saying but it, 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 you're talking about like a broad because the like what you just described could also apply to i guess sila mostly 
you know, so and maybe I'm being overly like picky about it. <clears throat> I'd love to say. <laughs> nope, not at all. No, I mean, you're totally right that in terms of the Eightfold Path, Virya falls under Samadhi, so meditation. But why does it, why is it there? Two reasons. Or I, I can think of two reasons. I'm sure there are many, many reasons. The first reason it is in Samadhi, or under that category, is that Basically, and I, I, I mentioned this in my opening remarks, I said this thing about Virya is showing up, right? Mm -hmm. I mentioned that idea. It's like showing up to do the work. And so the idea of the reason why right effort is under Samadhi is because they're specifically talking about that you can only get into Samadhi by putting forth the right effort. And that that's, it's more in line with my uh, lucid dreaming analogy. The idea that samadhi comes forth from you putting forth the effort in meditation. Now, everything that I was just talking about, where I kind of brought this into, you're right, Noam, I brought this into the realm of Sheila. But the idea is, is that one cannot get into samadhi if one's mind is clouded with unwholesome dharmas. And so one needs to put forth the effort to kind of eliminate those unwholesome dharmas, because that's the only way you're going to get into a samadhi. This, of course, is all part of the early teachings in that way. But does that answer your question, Noam? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. I also just want to mention that Virya is in the early system. Virya is, it's kind of almost a superpower. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's part of, it's one of the five spiritual faculties. And the five spiritual faculties are what bring about the supernatural powers, like flying, levitation, teleportation, all of these different supernatural powers are said to come from cultivating the five spiritual faculties of which virya is one. And so the idea is, is that this virya, this effort is almost superhuman in a way, and it can reach superhuman states, they say. But again, in order to achieve that, one has to put forth the effort in that sense. All right, because of time, I want to put sort of a, uh, I want to put a conclusion on Virya as it was, as it is understood in that early path. So the conclusion that I want to put on this is This, the early path, every, everything that I just said about Virya is all entirely about one's own liberation. Everything I just said about effort, it was all about my defiled mind putting forth the effort to clear out my defiled mind, putting forth the effort to for me to meditate, for me to develop the supernatural powers, and ultimately for me to end my suffering. So the effort is entirely for one's own benefit in that way. Now, we shift gears, and now we're going to start talking about skillful virya, which is to say virya as it's practiced by the bodhisattva. So not by the arahat or those aspiring to be arahats, to be worthy ones, but the bodhisattva path. So the main thing, of course, that we have been learning about the bodhisattva path, and this goes back now to last year's series on the bodhisattva path, 
But the thing that we've learned about the Bodhisattva path is that it is entirely directed towards all sentient beings. The liberation, the alleviation of suffering of all sentient beings. One is included in the realm of sentient beings in that way, so it is kind of tacitly understood that the bodhisattva is also, in a way, pursuing their own liberation in that sense. But the wisdom of the bodhisattva is that the only way that that is going to happen is through the liberation or enlightenment of all sentient beings. So what we're going to now talk about now is virya, but how does virya, how, skillful virya, what exactly does that mean for a bodhisattva to skillfully practice virya? Well, there's a couple of different ideas. One of them is going to bring us back to the sutra. So I'm going to hold off on that. But I want to kind of just give you a few bullet points for skillful virya. So if you keep that in mind, that the bodhisattva is entirely focused on benefiting all sentient beings. So how could this virya, or how could this drive, or how could this determination be seen as benefiting all sentient beings? Well, the first thing that comes to mind right away is the opposite of virya. Let's take a look at that again. So the opposite of virya is this idea of being lazy, kind of staying in bed, right? Putting forth the least amount of effort possible. Maybe this involves a lot of uh, binge watching of television or what have you. But the idea is, is if I'm in that state where I'm not getting out of bed from laziness, if I'm not really doing anything, and I'm especially not doing anything for anybody else, how is that, how is that laziness going to benefit all sentient beings? From the Bodhisattva's point of view, the laziness is detrimental to themselves, and it's detrimental to everybody else in that way. Whereas if the bodhisattva is driven to get up and go every morning, the idea is, is that they're probably going to be driven to get up and go help some people. <laughs> and so what I'm thinking of now is, you know, some of the great bodhisattvas that have, you know, kind of graced us with their presence thinking about, you know, like a Thich Nhat Hanh, for example, always a go-to for me of the, of like pinnacle of, you know, potential enlightenment in that way. And the idea is, is that if you read about the life of Thich Nhat Hanh, I mean, the guy was extremely driven, extremely mm -hmm. determined in that sense. But it's so obvious that he was not like looking out for himself in that practice of his. He was entirely getting up every morning, seemingly, to help benefit all beings. And then spending all day benefiting all beings and going to sleep thinking about how to benefit all beings. And so that's a, you know, a great example in that sense of, yes, the drive and the determination to put forth the effort to help others, to put forth the effort for the other. That's definitely skillful meditation, or sorry, skillful determination. We're going to read a little bit about that again. But there's also this other aspect of it that it, it won't come up in the sutra, so I want to talk about it now. The other aspect of skillful virya is it's a, it has a lot to do with, I suppose, what I would just call being a role model. Mm -hmm. And the idea that the bodhisattva is full of drive and determination and energy to kind of encourage everybody to be driven, to be full of energy. This kind of like, come on, everybody, 
we can do this. Like we can do this. And that kind of drive and energy of the bodhisattva gets other people excited about being bodhisattvas. And pretty soon there's this kind of you know, excitement about the bodhisattva path. But imagine I got up here on Sundays and I was like, hi guys. <laughs> you want to talk about Dharma? Okay. <laughs> Anyways, you know, it just, it, it would kind of be not so encouraging <laughs> to the aspiring bodhisattvas out there. And so skillful determination, skillful drive in that way that it's for the benefit of all beings. And again, the bodhisattva recognizes, and this is a thing I've said now um, in all the previous sessions, the bodhisattva realizes that to be driven, to have energy and, and, and drive, that's a win-win. Whereas the bodhisattva understands if I just stay in bed all day, that's bad for me and it's bad for my family, for my friends, for my community. It's detrimental to us both. And that's where the bodhisattva's sort of wisdom is situated in recognizing that all, all these paramitas, and especially even next week, it'll be an interesting conversation next week when we talk about skillful meditation and how it could be that one's own meditation practice is beneficial to others. That'll be interesting. So we'll talk about that next week. Okay, and any questions so far? Or any more questions? Cool. So now let's get to the sutra. The first thing we're going to do with the sutra is we're going to look at the little section that I started reading last time. And that little section, it was about how um, it's about how the bodhisattva who practices upaya skillful means, it's how they can cultivate all six of the paramitas just through the first paramita of giving. <laughs> and you'll remember that it talked about, of course, of course, the bodhisattva can practice the paramita of giving by giving. So <laughs> that one's kind of obvious. But then it even talks about that the bodhisattva keeps the precepts and makes offerings to those who keep the precepts, and they persuade those who have broken the precepts to observe the precepts, and then they bestow offerings. They give people gifts when they uh, follow the precepts in that way. So through giving, there's a following of the precepts in that way. The bodhisattva rids themselves of hatred, practices kindness and compassion, and with an undefiled mind benefits all sentient beings by impartially giving them alms. So this is the paramita of patience or kashanti, but as an act of giving or practicing patience through the act of giving. And now to virya. While giving food or drink or medicine or what have you, the bodhisattva is full of vigor, full of virya in mind and body. Whether they are going or coming, advancing, stopping, bending or stretching, looking up or looking down. This is the paramita of virya. So not super illustrative in that way, I get it, but just to let you know that it's this idea of being full of vigor in mind and body, no matter what you're doing, whether you're coming or going or stopping or stretching or looking up or looking down, it's all done with virya, right? Okay, so let's talk about, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So yeah, this will get this will get back to where I would like to get tonight, but I'm just skipping down a little bit. The Buddha told 
the Bodhisattva Nyanotada, and that the Bodhisattva whose name means highest wisdom or highest knowledge, Nyanotada, is the Bodhisattva that asked the Buddha about Upaya. So the Buddha tells the Bodhisattva Nyanotada, Kulaputra, noble child. It's just like you say, even when a Bodhisattva who practices Upaya, even though they might only give a little bit, they obtain immeasurable, countless merit by virtue of that upaya. And this is what I mentioned in the very first class, which is that the bodhisattva is you know, ever mindful of the other in that way, in all of their actions. And so even if they're giving the slightest amount, and it said in our first session, even if they're giving that slightest amount to a small animal, it surpasses the giving of, say, the Hinayana, because it's being done for the benefit of all beings. So even when a bodhisattva who practices upaya gives only a little, they obtain immeasurable amounts of merit. The Buddha told Nyanotara, Kulaputra, even when a bodhisattva has reached the stage of non-regression, which is pretty high up there, they still practice giving upayakli or giving skillfully. This is the upaya practiced by a bodhisattva. Now, Kulaputra. Sometimes bad people may urge the bodhisattva to forsake sentient beings, saying, Why do you stay in samsara for such a long time? You can enter nirvana early in this life. Nyanatara, the bodhisattva should leave these people as soon as they hear this, thinking, but I have adorned myself with the great vow to teach and transform all sentient beings. And these people are trying to stop me. If, if I don't stay in samsara, how can I teach and transform all incalculable numbers of sentient beings? And I'm going to skip the next part, but that introduces, oh, sorry. Uh, in this book, I'm on page 430. Apologies for that. So I'm on page 430, getting towards the bottom. And so right there, that's that idea. And I want to talk about that for one second. So they mentioned the Bodhisattva in this stage of non-regression. And I, don't talk, I haven't talked about it much in the Dharma doors here. It's an idea that I would probably explore a little later on, maybe even later on this year. But in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, there is a, a schema, in a way, and it's called the 10 stages of the Bodhisattva. So the Bodhisattva is understand the process of enlightenment, the process of the Bodhisattva is understood to take place in these 10 stages. And at a certain stage, I think it's the seventh or eighth, but don't quote me on that, but it's up there towards the seventh or the eighth. The Bodhisattva reaches the stage of what is called non-regression. There's no more sliding back to old behaviors, to old habituations, one, the Bodhisattva has really cleared themselves out of all uh, those um, afflictions in that way. And there's this idea in the stages, in the Bodhisattva path, there's this idea where the Bodhisattva basically could just whoop, enter nirvana. Nirvana, out. <laughs> And they just drift into the unconditioned, nirvana. And they could do it, but they choose not to. They choose to stay in samsara because of their vow to liberate all sentient beings. So that's what this is about, about this person coming along and saying, hey, why are you still in samsara? 
you should just get out of here. Mm -hmm. And the, the Bodhisattva thinks, but if I did that, how am I going to liberate all sentient beings? Mm -hmm. Right? So now, given all of that, that I just said, I want to point out this section. So at the very bottom of page 430, so I'm just skipping a little section, but Nyanotara, the Bodhisattva Nyanotara, asks the Buddha, world honored one. So when does a Bodhisattva commit transgressions? All right. The Buddha replied to Nyanotara Bodhisattva, Kulaputra. If a bodhisattva harbors the view of the Dharma held by Shravakas and Pratyakya Buddhas, then they commit heavy transgressions. Even if they keep the Pratimoksha precepts, have eaten only fruits and grass for hundreds of thousands of kopas, and is able to tolerate the good and bad words uttered by sentient beings. Kulaputra, just as Shravakas cannot attain supreme enlightenment if they continue without repentance to harbor the view of Dharma held by Shravakas and Pratyekhi Buddhas. As long as they think that way, it is absolutely impossible for such bodhisattvas to acquire the Buddha Dharma, this becoming a Buddha. So, that is a very interesting, very important uh, thing that I want to talk about. So the Bodhisattva asks, so what constitutes a transgression for a Bodhisattva, right? And this is important if you kind of keep in mind some things that I've said in classes prior that have come up. And I basically have mentioned that because of the bodhisattva's vow to liberate all sentient beings and to be compassionate for all sentient beings, it may so happen that the bodhisattva sort of on the surface breaks a precept. And what I've said in the past is that, but because they're driving um, impetus, the reason why they're doing everything is for the benefit of others, there's in a way no transgression. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of situations that I can think of. There's a lot of situations where I've been in where I've recognized that I, I sort of like, you know, uh, an example I'll, I'll give, it's not exactly, yeah, no, it's very, it's personal, but again, I'm always trying to do more personal anecdotes in this series. It has to do with when I used to be vegan. And so I basically had made a vow that I wasn't going to consume animal products and all of that. But I had also gotten into Mahayana Buddhism. I'd gotten into the Bodhisattva path. And there was a moment where I was faced with this situation where it was either me keeping my personal precept against eating meat or for the benefit of the group, for the benefit of everybody, not making it about me, <laughs> not making it about my dietary restrictions, but actually I, for the benefit of the group and all everybody involved, I just ate my little bit of the meal. I could go into more detail about the circumstances. I don't think it's necessary. But the point is, is that my feeling at that point was this, meaning the social cohesion and benefiting all these people, was way more important than me, like sticking to this thing. It, it just, the, um, the selfishness of it was revealed to me in that moment. And so, I had no problem breaking my precept in that way for the benefit of the group. So that's just one example, but I've mentioned others. 
So that being the case, right? The Bodhisattva asks, so then what constitutes a transgression for a Bodhisattva? And of course the answer is, well, to entertain, or what was the actual language? To harbor, to have the view of the Dharma held by the Hinayana, what are called the Shravakas and Pratekyabhutas. Now, remember everything that I said about the Hinayana. It is a path entirely about one's own liberation. And I want to mention this too. It's not out of, in that early path in the Hinayana, it's not out of exactly, it's not out of lack of compassion. It's not out of um, uh, not, you know, being compassionate and kind in that way. It's actually, uh, at least as far as I can tell, it seems to be built in to the Dharma, the philosophy of the Hinayana. And what that philosophy is that I'm referring to, it's the teaching, the philosophy, the Dharma, that each sentient being is responsible for their own karma. And therefore, we are all sort of alone in the process, according to the Hinayana. But it's a matter of karma. And what they will often cite in the, in the Hinayana, they will often say that when I eat, it doesn't satiate your hunger. And that's an example of that my karma, which has to do with my body and my stomach and all of that, that if I'm hungry, I have to eat. If I'm suffering, I got to do the practice. And so there's this idea of a kind of individual karma that is present in the early teachings that basically make it a path of individual salvation. Whereas the Mahayana philosophy, teachings, Dharma, don't have that view of karma. And I'll explain why that is. Yeah, I have time. So let me explain how that works quickly. So in that way that I just said, where when I eat, it doesn't satisfy your hunger. The idea is, is that you can kind of and you don't have to kind of, you can literally like think about this. It's about what I call, and now this is just a Michaelism note. You will not find this in any sutras or any teachings. This is a Michaelism. But I think of it as a karmic axis. And the idea is, is that there's all these words coming out of this axis. And there's physical action coming from this axis. And there's mental action coming from this axis. And so the experience is that, you know, a classic example. If I say something mean to somebody, and let's say that that action of mine, so a karma, an action, was to say something mean. The idea is, is that that person might get upset by that. And then they might come over and, <laughs> and punch me because they've gotten so mad about the thing that I said. And that would be karma, cause and effect. That's all karma is about, by the way. Don't get it don't get it twisted. Karma is not metaphysical mumbo jumbo. It's just cause and effect. Everything is cause and effect. And so from a, that karmic point of view, because of what I said, the karma comes back to the axis. If I said the mean thing, the person isn't going to go hit somebody over there. I mean, they might, but now we're getting into some complicated karma. <laughs> My point is, hmm. is that 
if they came and punched me and I was wondering, why did they punch me? Oh, it's because of what I said, right? So that's the karmic axis that I'm talking about. The idea that there's a karmic axis where what this performs, says, and thinks comes back to the axis, right? Makes, makes perfect sense. Trust me, I've thought about it. It makes perfect sense. Now, the thinking of someone who believes in that karmic axis, the thinking is, is that this is my karma coming back to the axis. And what's going on over there with that person or that karmic axis? That's their karma. And what's going on over there is that karma. And what's going on is that karma. And what the Mahayana tradition realizes about that understanding of karma is that it is delusional, absolutely, utterly delusional to think that what is going on right there doesn't affect me. Like that that karma over there isn't wrapped up in my karma and that that karma isn't wrapped up in my karma and that this karma isn't wrapped up in their karma. And what the Mahayana seems to have realized and what the Bodhisattva seems to realize is that there will appear to be such a karmic axis when you're clinging to the self and the body because you only care about yourself. And so you dismiss all this other karma as other people's problems. <laughs> And so it's the realization that it will appear that there is a karmic axis when you are attached to the self. And so the bodhisattva, not being interested in being attached to the self, sort of recognizes that we it's a big karma ball. <laughs> this whole reality is one big karma ball in that way. And it's utterly, again, it's utterly delusional to sort of crimp crimp oneself off from the karma ball as if you are an island unto yourself with your own little karma situation. It's not like that. So while the Hinayana believes in that karmic axis and is therefore only going to be operating within that, the Bodhisattva is karma's everywhere in that sense. So the idea, though, is that it is a tra it transgression. It's a problem in that sense if the bodhisattva entertains, harbors, as it says, the dharma of the Hinayana. Which is to say, when does a bodhisattva transgress? When they slip back into being self-interested when they slip back into only being concerned in their individual salvation. And the vow, the bodhisattva vow, is to liberate all sentient beings. So the only transgression of a bodhisattva in that sense can be if they forsake, if they give up on sentient beings and they say, you know what, everybody? Good luck. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. I'm out of here. <laughs> That's a transgression from the perspective of a bodhisattva, giving up on all the sentient beings. So, okay, any questions about that before we get to the controversial dharma? Okay. So, <clears throat> I mentioned, um, excuse me, one sec. So I mentioned um, when I started this sutra a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of this series, I mentioned that this sutra is considered a little controversial, like there's some stuff going on in here. And so we're going to get into it. So and because of time, I am going to skip around a little bit and leave some sections out, but I'm over on page 431. This is right after the part that I just read. And then the venerable Ananda. So the Buddha's cousin, right? Ananda, Ashravaka. Somebody from the Hinayana, of course. 
So then the Venerable Ananda said to the Buddha, World Honored One, this morning, when I was begging for food from door to door in the city of Shravasti, I saw Bodhisattva, king honored by all, sit on the same couch as a woman. <gasps> as soon as Ananda uttered these words, quakes of six kinds shook the earth. <laughs> From the assembly, Bodhisattva, king honored by all, ascended into mid-air to the height of seven palm trees and asked Ananda, Venerable, how could an offender stay floating in mid-air? Ananda, you may ask the world honored one this. What is a transgression and what is not a transgression? Then Ananda, kneeling on his right knee and clasping the Buddha's feet with his hands, said woefully, World honored one, I now repent my fault. I slandered such a great giant, saying he was an offender. I found fault with this great bodhisattva, world honored one. Now I repent my wrongdoing. May the world honored one accept my sincere apologies. The Buddha told Ananda, you should not find fault with great bodhisattvas of the Mahayana. Ananda, you Shravakas of the Hinayana practice in a secluded place. The meditation leading to ultimate quiescence and the cutting off of all passions without hindrance. However, Ananda, a bodhisattva who practices upaya, has achieved a mind so inclined to all knowing wisdom that they may even amuse themselves with maids of honor in a palace, and they will not be affected by Mara's influences and, their, and other various hindrances and they will attain supreme enlightenment. Why? Because Ananda, when enjoying pleasures with sentient beings, the bodhisattvas who practice upaya without exception, all persuade them to pursue supreme enlightenment through the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Ananda, as long as good men and good women who learn the Mahayana are not apart from the aspiration for all-knowing wisdom, they can amuse themselves with the five delightful sensual pleasures when they encounter them. Ananda, you should think such bodhisattvas cultivate the root that leads to Buddhahood. Okay, so I will, I'll pause there for a second. So this, of course, is a controversial statement. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, I, I will, I, I actually maybe even should read the end of it. Yeah, let me read the end of this and then we'll talk about it because I think this is the only one that we'll get to anyways. There's two controversial sections. We'll just read this one. So the Buddha says to Ananda further to explain this whole situation with the Bodhisattva sitting on the couch with the woman. <clears throat> Listen attentively, Ananda. Why did Bodhisattva Mahasattva, king honored by all, sit on a couch with that woman? Ananda, that woman has been the wife of Bodhisattva, king honored by all, in five, excuse me, in 500 previous lifetimes. <laughs> because of past habits, she was attracted to Bodhisattva King honored by all and couldn't tear herself away from him whenever she saw him. Bodhisattva King honored by all has awesome virtues and handsome features because uh -huh. of the power of his discipline. At the sight of him, that woman was overwhelmed with joy 
alone in a secluded place, she thought, if Bodhisattva king honored by all can sit on the same couch with me, I shall generate bodhicitta. I shall become a bodhisattva. Ananda. At that time, Bodhisattva King honored by all read that woman's mind. On the following morning, clad in monastic robes and holding a begging bowl in his hands, he begged for food from door to door in Shravasti. When he arrived at that woman's house, he entered it thinking at once. The inner earth element and the outer earth element are one and the same. He took the woman's hand and sat together with her on the couch with a mind as steady as the earth. Seated on the couch, Bodhisattva King honored by all spoke in verse saying, the Tathagata disapproves of indulgence in desires. One who is free from desires and lust can become a teacher of gods and humans. The Buddha said to Ananda, hearing the verse, that woman was overwhelmed with joy. Immediately, she rose from her seat, prostrated herself with her head on the floor to Bodhisattva King honored by all and spoke in verse saying, I will uproot my lust and desires, which the Buddhas decry, for one who is free from desires of lust can become a teacher of gods and humans. Having spoken this verse, she said, I should repent having an improper desire. And right then she engendered the proper desire and she brought forth bodhicitta for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. So this is an example of what I was talking about, which is to say that the Bodhisattva has broken a precept. And if you don't know, I want to tell you what the precept is here. So somebody like Ananda, like a Shravaka, somebody in the Hinayana, a, a Buddhist monk, well, according to the Pratimoksha, according to the Vinaya, Buddhist monks are not to touch a woman, a, a member of the opposite sex. They are not supposed to look a member of the opposite sex in the eyes. By the way, all of this goes for nuns regarding uh, men. And I've even seen more modern uh, Buddhist organizations include those who would have same-sex desires in that way. And they say, yeah, so if you're attracted, to, if you're a woman and you're attracted to a woman, don't look women in the eyes. <laughs> don't touch other women in that way. So the, my point is, is that there are these pretty serious rules for monastics about not touching those who they are sexually desire, desirous of, not looking those people in the eye, not being alone in the same room as them, this is actually a big problem in monasteries where monks and nuns it can't like a monk and a nun cannot be alone in a room together. So a nun has to go find another nun or a monk has to go like it gets complicated. So Ananda is used to those rules, these really serious rules that go so far as to not even making eye contact. So he sees this bodhisattva all sitting on a couch with a woman and they're looking like they're intimate in that way and so ananda freaks he's like whoa bodhisattva king honored by all has broken the precept and then we hear the backstory about why bodhisattva king honored by all was hanging out on the couch with this woman there there was a lot more to it than all of that and what the story says is that Bodhisattva king honored by all, their only intention was to benefit the woman. To She said, you know, if, 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 if he'd only sit on the couch with me, I'll ben generate bodhicitta and become a bodhisattva. So bodhisattva king honored by all said, well, then let's have a seat. <laughs> and because the intention was for the other, there is no transgression. Now, I want to say something that I mentioned 
uh, I don't know if it was last week or the week before. And it, what I mentioned was, is uh, it was about reading these sutras, in particular reading Mahayana sutras. So the thing that came up a couple, either last time or a couple weeks ago, it was about a bodhisattva. Oh, basically it was about if somebody was going to be punished for something they did, car either karmically or even by the state, you know, but was going to receive punishment for a transgression. The sutra suggested that the bodhisattva step up and say, hey, no, 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 I'll go to jail. Don't let that, you know, they, they've got stuff to do. Let me go to jail. Oh, you're, you know, let me take the punishment for them in that way. And what I said in, in that class, uh, whenever that was, is there's kind of two different things going on here. One is that if you were actually in a situation where you could somehow actually take somebody's place in, in, in a situation, and then there's the question of whether you should do that or not. That's one thing. But what I brought up was, it's, there's another thing in terms of the way that we react to reading about that. Like nobody's asked you to do it in that way, but you're hearing about it. And even the thought of it is like offensive, like in that way, like why should they have to stand in for somebody, you know? And the point is, is that the Bodhisattva in reading this about that such altruism, like extreme levels of altruism, where the Bodhisattva is willing to take the hit for somebody else in that way. What I suggested in that class was that we should probably analyze our own reaction to even hearing about altruism, let alone actually being altruistic. Well, I kind of want to remind, say the same thing regarding this. If you were to read this literally, like as if it were an account of an actual event that took place, you could have some problems with it. I it would have some problems with it. If, if it was sort of supposed to be something that really happened. But this is a story. It, he's, he's floating in the midair to the height of seven palm trees, right? So it's totally allegorical. And so it's utterly kind of a story about Ananda who represents this really conservative, really like strict form of monasticism. And then this kind of like Mahayana Bodhisattva thing that's really into saving all sentient beings and really into improving society. And so the story is sort of about which, wh who of these two people is more pure? <laughs> the monk who's obediently following all the rules to perfection for their own salvation? Or a bodhisattva who's trying to help everybody out to the best of their ability and even breaks their own precept in that way for the benefit of others. So it's kind of about these two mentalities and the purity or impurity of these mentalities. And then the, you know, the background story to kind of contextualize those mentalities. So, by the way, I, I do want to say that I do find this sutra problematic, but not problematic because of what you know, what it just said, I, I agree. I think that people should be able to sit on the couch with whoever they want to sit on the couch with, and it shouldn't be a major transgression. So I agree with all of that. But I do want you to know that I personally, like, well, let me put it to you this way. I'm still looking, and I would be delighted to find a story about a female bodhisattva sitting on a couch with a male bodhisattva, and the female bodhisattva was doing it for the benefit of this male person. So 
this sutra, for me, what's controversial about it is it's a little patriarchal. Yeah. It's a little leaning towards the male side of this, but I got to tell you, and I don't want to be an apologist for patriarchy. I do not want to be an apologist for patriarchy. My own, but if I were to be an apologist for the patriarchy, I would suggest that the idea of why these stories lean a little bit more towards the masculine in that way is because they were being presented to, taught to, and read by predominantly male. And so they want the main figures to match up with the people who are reading it in that way. Not that that's an excuse for patriarchy and not that that's an excuse for an imbalanced presentation of the Dharma. So I'm critiquing this sutra for that reason. Um, but I think that the underlying message of altruism and like extreme altruism is a good one. But I would love to hear your opinions or insights or questions or comments. Yeah. Anybody? All right. Oh, no. Um, I, I was a little surprised by the part previous to this part of the sutra where uh um i forgot who asked like when when does what does a so bodhisattva do that's a that's transgress or that no, i forgot the words but what where the but where the buddha said that when a bodhisattva uh has a mind like a like a hinayana monk that that's when they're messing up that's that seems like a little harsh Mm -hmm. I mean, I get, I understood your explanation. I get it, but it seems a little harsh in the in the battle between Hinayana and Mahayana. You know. <clears throat> now, I hear you, Noam, and I just want to say one thing to make it kind of clear. It is. I don't read it. At least, I do not read it as saying that to have the mind of a Shravaka is a transgression. I read it as saying that if one has taken the Bodhisattva vow and is pursuing the Bodhisattva path mm -hmm. and then kind of takes up the Shravaka point of view, they're saying that's a transgression. And mm -hmm. again, and I know that you know that I said this, the transgression is that one has made a vow to save all sentient beings yeah. and then one is kind of reneging on that yeah. vow. Yeah. But if we look deeper that it, it's not about the renege, you know, it's not about the like taking back of the vow exactly. It's more about, well, in many ways, it's about what this series has been about in terms of the skillful practice of these things, where there is this super altruistic place that everything's coming from for the bodhisattva. And yeah, I mean, the thing that I'll say to kind of conclude this, if I can, to try to connect a few dots, the thing that underlies the kind of the bodhisattva path, there's a really like acute awareness of the problems of self. Of course, all forms of Buddhism talk about no self, the wisdom of that teaching and all of that. But the Bodhisattva path is very acutely aware of like that basically the position of the Bodhisattva, the position of the Mahayana is that, well, the position of the Mahayana is that if you really look at it. And what I mean is, is that if you really dig and you look at violence in the world, 
anger, hatred, disputes, all of the everything, all of the worst stuff of this world. If you dig deep enough into it, you can identify that all of it, violence and everything, comes from a gross misunderstanding of the self. From a Buddhist point of view, by which I mean that this delusional sense of self, that is the underlying cause of all the rest. And this is kind of what the Mahayana kind of has recognized, is that basically all of these um, manifest behaviors, being violent, being angry, all of these things, they're all actually resting on a delusional sense of self. And so actually, if you could just remove that, there wouldn't be the rest in that. You wouldn't even have to work on all of that because there just wouldn't be the, the, the root cause of it. And so with that in mind, the bodhisattva, it, it all becomes about the other in that way. It all becomes, because any notion of like, I'm going to get liberated, or I'm going to purify my karma, or I'm going to do that. It, it's going to stay within that realm of self. And so the bodhisattva, again, is entirely directed towards the other in that way. Now, I want to mention something really quick about that idea of now being directed towards the other. So a very clever Dharma student has said, but isn't that still reifying the self in terms of helping others? Insightful, indeed. Mm -hmm. And my, and by the way, this was a, a real person that asked me this. So my answer to that clever, smart Dharma student, my answer, and I've, and the reason why I have this answer is because I've answered this question a number of times. And my answer to that is about, there is kind of being, um, but basically like you're that, idea that critique is correct at an intellectual level but the point is is that we still do believe in the other <laughs> like they are still there in that way and so the bodhisattva is practicing this compassion and all of the paramitas in that way for the other and it, in a way, if we get too smart and we're like, oh, there's no you, there's no me, ha, ha, ha. Yeah, that only gets you so far. It really does. It's really too intellectual and it's not coming from the heart enough. And the bodhisattva really does, the bodhisattva path comes from the heart in that way. So the wisdom is about recognizing the fault of self and really wanting to do practices that just don't reinforce it. And maintaining that kind of compassion towards the other, even through the wisdom of emptiness and the wisdom of no self, still seeing the benefit of being, uh, having the practice be towards the other. So on that note of the other, I'm gonna bid farewell to you all, unless there's any last minute questions, comments, answers, ideas. All right, everybody, I'll pass it over back over to Gnome for any news. Uh, do you have any news? Um, I guess the I'm only news in case you, uh, folks aren't aware or whatever, but um, I do have uh, like a, a SoundCloud, a kind of podcast. I don't think it's a podcast, but people call it that. Uh, <laughs> so that's the Lotus Underground, which is on SoundCloud. And I mainly have been doing sutra recitations. Um, everybody knows I love sutras. And so I just recently uploaded, it's about an hour or so, and it's a recitation of the Sri Maladevi Sutra. So where this, huh. speaking of which, 
a female yeah. bodhisattva gives all the teachings in that. So I have found that sutra, which is a very popular sutra. Um, and so I've been uploading sutra recitations a lot lately. So if you haven't been by there, go check it out. Uh, otherwise, I'll be back next Sunday. I'm right here. <laughs>